Hello everyone, I'm Sai Van Prala. I'm a senior researcher with the Autonomous Systems Research Group at Microsoft. And I'm here with Guillaume Leclerc from MIT. And we're going to be talking about our recent presentation at NeurIPS, which is the paper on 3DB, a framework for debugging computer vision models. This is a big collaboration between MIT and Microsoft and across groups at Microsoft as well. So the main motivation for this work is the question, you know, can I trust the predictions of computer vision models such as classification or object detection models? Because we know through recent literature that computer vision models are sensitive to many kinds of perturbations, some of which we don't understand completely as well. So if we look at some of the recent papers, we've seen works that talk about um, the sensitivity of computer vision models to things like texture bias. And for example, if you have images that have certain kinds of corruptions on them, the outputs of these models are completely uh, misclassified or misdetected. At the same time, even very simple transformations, such as geometric transformations, for example, if you put an object in a slightly different pose than what was observed in the training data set, we tend to see some different results in what's expected. And similarly, there are issues with backgrounds and um, JPEG compressions and occlusions from unfamiliar objects and things like that. So what we would want to understand is how do we benchmark the performance of these models and how do we reliably identify these failure cases so we can build robust and better models that can be deployed in the wild. But there are several challenges when it comes to benchmarking models and understanding how they work. So for example, we talked about several perturbations in the previous slide and um, all of these things, all of these different kinds of perturbations require a very different way of setting the perturbations up and doing the analysis and getting out the results. So it involves a lot of manual labor such as um, changing the images, transforming the objects, changing the rendering schemes and things like that. But at the same time, you know, if we want to combine several of these perturbations together, so we want to compose different kinds of transformations, again, it's a fairly um, you know, intractable and challenging thing to do. And finally, we would want to perform these evaluations at a much larger scale because we care about big models that are applicable to a lot of different kinds of objects, a lot of different kinds of scenarios. So this, would, this needs to be a large scale effort where we talk about many classes of objects and large models and performing inference uh, on the fly. So this involves a significant amount of engineering effort. So that leads us to the, to the main question. How do we diagnose these model failures in a scalable, systematic, efficient, automated way? Because ideally, we would want this to be part of any model training pipeline. So every time we train a new computer vision model, we would want to understand what the vulnerabilities are, what the failure cases are, and potentially go augment our data sets so we can you know, uh, kind of create better models and keep learning uh, from corner cases and edge cases in the real world. So to that end, we present what we call 3DB, which is a framework, and it's kind of like a play on words. It's 3D debugger, so it's like 3D and GDB or something like that, so it's 3D debugger. So at its core, 3DB is a, it's a framework for diagnosing computer vision models by generating synthetic imagery that contains a lot of different kinds of corner cases that you would want to test against. So it basically uh, generates what we can call synthetic images under different kinds of corruptions, transformations, and um, other perturbations. So the workflow can be thought of uh, something like this. Assume we have a few object classes we are interested in. So maybe we'll have a bunch of 3D models that uh, correspond to these classes, like you know coffee mugs or kettles and things like that. So we take these 3D models and we also have a set of environments, right? So we can uh, think of any kind of backgrounds so or different kinds of 3D environments in a simulator. So we use Blender in this version of our work. So we can place these assets or you know, object meshes in the environments. And then we have a uh, set of what we call perturbations or controls. So these are essentially, think of them as some kinds of axes along which you would want to modify certain parameters so that we can understand how the model works at different values of these parameters. So they can be things like, maybe I want to change the parameters of a camera, such as the focal length or the, the zoom level or something like that. I would want to understand the effects of object pose. Maybe if I change the object on different poses, how well does the performance of my model, uh, uh, how well does my model do? Same thing with things like lighting and changes to textures, changes to um, you know, putting other objects in the scene. So there are several possibilities that we can think about when we, when we want to benchmark models. So 3DB allows us to set up these kinds of um, uh, perturbations in a, in, a, in a more efficient way. And finally, we, we render these synthetic images that combine and compose several of these perturbations. This creates essentially like a data set upon which you can train our, uh, sorry, test our models and understand the performance and then go back with our findings and maybe retrain the models or just make them more, uh, more robust. Um, a quick overview of how we sort of set this up in the workflow is 3DB is very easily configurable and extensible. 
So basically, most of it is operated through like a YAML file. So we basically have a configuration. Uh, for instance, in this configuration, I'm going to identify a few key things. Let's say we are interested in benchmarking the typical image that we trained um, Torch Vision ResNet 18 model for classification, right? And then we pick Blender as our backend because that's where we render and you know generate and render all of this synthetic imagery. And then I'm, I can also specify the parameters that I'm interested in changing. So I would want to understand the effects of the camera pose, the effects of um, you know camera zoom. So I could specify some things like that, and we can define a certain kind of a policy. Like, do we want to do a grid search? Do we want to do like a random search over different different parameters? And all of these configuration YAML then goes into 3DB. Uh, 3DB parses this YAML, understands what we're looking for, sets up you know, the model for inference through PyTorch or any framework that you choose, uh, uses Blender in this, in this case to set up the, the renderer and the uh, synthetic image generator, and essentially renders a bunch of images corresponding to what we want as the perturbations of interest. And finally, it basically has a result dashboard where you can see the performance of your model under various conditions. So an example here is showing um, you know, all the images marked in green are basically where your model is you know, classifying things correctly, but you also have a bunch of images in red, which we can think of as challenging cases for the model, and it would be good for us to understand why that's happening and you know, potentially go improve our models. So now I would like to hand it off to Guillaume to talk more about the framework. Hey, thank you, Sai. So I'm going to start with a... Um, with a little example and show what this rendering space that we've been talking about with, a, with two dimensions here, for example. So we're going to start with the, the camera pose, as we mentioned in the previous slides. And then we're also going to consider the distance to an object. So this forms what we call the, the rendering space. And we can have any points in the space and we can explore it with 3DB using either a random search pattern and we're going to be here and there on that, on that space, or a grid search, which can be very useful if you're doing some sort of, of causal uh, understanding of what is happening. And each point of this space actually corresponds to a unique image that we can render using 3DB, and then pass it to the model and evaluate the performance of that model. And that's very useful because now we know the performance of the model not only on this image, but we know what it corresponds to originally before the image was rendered. This helps us identify problems, in this case, related to camera pose, or problems related to the distance of the object, or even better, which other methods currently cannot allow us to do, only when the problems occur in a combination of those two things. So here I showed an example with two dimensions for ease of visualization, but obviously 3DB generalized to way more dimensions, actually an arbitrary amount of one. And they can either be built in, we ship the, the project with a set of of, of dimensions that you can already test with. But if, let's say, you're doing self-driving cars and you have like special needs, like, for example, you care about whether your model will be dependent on the color of the car that's ahead of it. And you really want to try all of the possible colors to make sure that there are no problems. This distance could become the color of the car. So we really wanted to make it like very extensible and to fit all the needs of the researchers around there. Um, so using this framework, we wanted to test whether we were actually able to identify and, and debug current, current models. So we just started with an ImageNet model, and we wanted to see if we can reproduce some of the existing findings that people have done using isolated techniques. So how are these models uh, sensitive to, to small perturbations? So we just started with camera distance, and as shown in previous research, the performance of the models actually greatly depends on this. If you get further away, the performance decre decreases much faster than if you actually get, get closer, which is, which is very interesting, but in line with how we think models work. We also tried camera direction, and it turns out that if you start going away from the standard uh, viewpoints that most people take their, their objects from, then the performance degrades dramatically, like by, by almost 60% in, in the worst cases. We also evaluated how the background Im, Im, impact the performance of the model, and we can see that th there, there's also a very wide range of performances. It goes from 34% on the easiest backgrounds that we tried, all the way down to 2% or 1% even on the worst ones. And we were like wondering, what is causing this? And it turns out that it's relatively easy to explain. And what happens is that 
as the backgrounds get more complicated and cluttered with a bunch of features, the performance decreases. So here, we just use a metric of background complexity and you can see that the accuracy that you obtain on your models is really related to that, that complexity and the clutterness that you have in, in your background. So this shows that the data sets that were trained to use, that were that are used to train ImageNet, actually were more biased towards simple backgrounds than more complex ones. Uh, another experiment that we found really interesting was trying to understand which parts of the object are actually uh, correlated with high accuracies and which ones are correlated with low accuracies. So here, each face of an object, if it's bluer, it means that when visible, it drives the accuracy down. If it's red, it drives the accuracy up. And also something that has been shown in previous research, there is this bias towards right-handedness in current data sets because most people are right-handed. So you will see that having the handle on this teapot on the right actually improve performance. But if you have it on the left, then you will, you will have lower performances because in the data set that we're used to train, again, this was a more common occurrence. Same for the hammer. If you go away from the very typical pose where the head of the hammer is at the top and the, the knee is pointing to the left, the, per, the performance increase. But more surprisingly, on this, uh, this coffee cup, we realize that when you see the inside of the cup, the performance is really, really bad. So what's cool about 3DB is that when you make this kind of discovery, you can start thinking about, OK, what kind of additional experiment can I, can I think of to try to understand deeper what is happening? So that's exactly what we did here. And we were suspecting that it potentially had something to do with, with what is inside the, 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 coffee, the coffee cup. So here we created three extra of those dimensions that I mentioned. And one is going to be coffee, one is going to be milk, and the last one is going to be water. So what happens as I move in that space and try basically all the combinations of liquid that I can put in my, my coffee cup? And it turns out that has a dramatic um, impact on the performance of the model. And the prediction that it's going to make will completely depend on what is inside of the, the cup. For example, if you start putting water in a coffee cup, it just thinks that it's a bucket, because who in their right mind would actually put water in a coffee mug? Uh, so it's really interesting because it taught us basically how does the model work. And what it, what it does is simply, if I don't see what's inside uh, the cup, I will look if there is a handle. If there is a handle, it's a coffee cup. As soon as I see inside, I completely ignore the shape of it, and I will completely rely on what is inside to make my prediction. So here again, we undiscovered a bias in the data set that transitioned into some weird decision rules that the model implemented. We wanted to show again that 3DB can be extensive, extensible, and also that we can easily reproduce existing research. In the past, Geros and Al showed that models, when presented between a confusing mixture of shape and texture, they will always rely on texture to make their decision. So here, this weird combination of a cat and the skin of, a, of an elephant translates to an elephant prediction, regardless of the shape. So we wanted to see if with 3db we can reproduce these, these findings, but in a way that, that uses images that are slightly more realistic than this, because this is like, as a human, you understand it, but it's clearly not a valid image. So we simply created a new dimension, that, the, the rendering dimension that we, met, that we explained before, and made it the texture of the object. So we can still move around and have like all the different poses, lighting, but now we can also explore the impact of changes in the texture. And it turns out that we obtain exactly the same conclusions as this paper, but it only took us a couple of lines of code, and the images that we obtain are much more realistic. The problem is all of this has been made using synthetic images. And if we cannot convince people that the insights that you obtain with this framework actually transfer to real life performance, then it's kind of like pointless. So what we wanted to test is, are we able to uh, get things that translate to the real world? So to do this, we took a real studio that we had at Microsoft Research, and we really carefully modeled it so that we can render it using 3DB, 
in a way that is completely indistinguishable. And then we ask 3DB to find combinations of poses and lighting and, and everything and that leads to misprediction of a, a standard image model on household objects that we also 3D scan carefully. And using those uh, failed uh, and successful combinations of, of poses, we try to reproduce them uh, by coming with a phone and try to match the synthetic image uh, as, as closely as we could. And it turns out that in more than 80% of the cases, when, the, when 3DB said we would fail on the real life images, we did. And when it said it would succeed, we did. So this gives us a lot of confidence that the insights that one researcher can obtain with 3DB will actually correspond to real life. And, and here are some, a couple of, of examples of uh, synthetic versus real images. And we see that they're very hard to, to distinguish. And most of the time, when the model uh, is, is correct on the synthetic images, it will be correct on real images. And, and vice versa for, for incorrectness. So what are the takeaways of, this, of these features? First, we confirm that models can fail in very, very weird uh, scenarios. And we really need to be able to determine what are those and be able to fix them. Th so it really motivates us to find and create a tool that will, be, that will be used to debug our models in a way that is reliable, scalable, transferred to the real world, and extensible to novel uses in the future. So this is what, why, we made, why we made 3DB. I would like to thank you, uh, the amazing team I, I collaborated on this project with. And I think if it wasn't for this team, we would not have been able to make such a, a large project and what I think is a, is a cool contribution. So thanks to, to everyone. And if you're interested, the code is, is open source. You can directly download it on, on GitHub and start running it. And if you want to dive a little deeper, we have, we have a blog post here and obviously the paper that we submitted at, at NeurIPS this year. Thank you very much. And we're happy to take any questions from, from the audience, if, if there is any. Thank you. Ty, anything to, to add? No, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, he has a question. Ah. So how do you, like, how does this compare with, like, stable diffusion? Do you have any do you have any ideas of, like, how this would be, like, the stable diffusion or something like that? Like, it seems like a different way of doing things. So, uh, so we have a question from the audience, and, and the question is, how does this compare to uh, stable diffusion models and diffusion models in, in general? So this is, this is a good question, because we've seen recently that, that these kind of models can produce very uh, realistic images. However, the way that we control them is, is usually by text or by using what we call like image prompts. And then the model try to find modifications from there. And, and there, like, I w what I would see two kind of, of drawbacks is, is first, the, the text doesn't really map into that kind of interesting space that we're presenting here. And, and secondly, that's the, the, image, the data that was used to train those stable diffusion models can be also biased in the way that we're actually trying to uncover with 3DB. So it's possible that the data we would obtain with those models would actually yeah, reflect those biases and we would not be able to, to, to debug them. What I think I envision is, is maybe a mixture of both, where we start with 3DB images and then use stable diffusion to make them even more realistic, but without changing the information, like the semantic information that's, that's present in them. So I think that's a cool avenue of, of research that we will probably integrate in, in 3DB in, in the future. Thank you for the question. I don't think there is. There is any other question. Well, thank you again. Thank you.